This guy doesn't need any introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Of all the musicians I've ever known in my life, Lou Whitney is one of them. And I mean that sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Lou is truly one of my favorite people on earth. He played at our wedding all those years ago, 30 years ago almost, and uh, I've known him forever. And matter of fact, when I first moved back to Springfield, I don't think there was a night that the Morels or Skeletons played that I missed. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing all, all of that wear for them. Uh, uh, Lou's, Lou's uh, the godfather, truly, of music here in our community has made such a difference in recording and playing. And Lou, we're just so glad you're here to share with us. So Lou, welcome in the Lou Whitney story. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Uh, I do remember those uh, the nights at the uh, the Amador Mining Company. You and uh, uh, the guys that would like. I remember I, the night I remember the most was that that uh, we played. We just we'd always walk up, work up an off the wall tune. So we wa worked up a, a Telstar, which was an instrumental, you know, that had real real recognizable. And I remember, it wasn't Brian, but the guys that always sat next to Brian, the guy that just broke a thing, a, a pitcher of beer over his head when we started that song. And he couldn't believe that we were playing. But uh, I came, I'm not a Springfield guy. Uh, oh, you can tell that. Uh, I came here in 1970, after I graduated from college. I majored, majored in real estate. And uh, you, well, you had to pick one. So I got my catalog out. I got my catalog out one night, and I went. I said real estate. I go. Huh, well, okay. So I so I majored in real estate. And so I was interviewing for jobs. And one of the companies that uh, that was interviewing at my college was an outfit named Strout Realty. Anybody remember that? Yeah. They had offices all over America, and they were headquartered in Springfield, Missouri. So I interviewed with them, and uh, I just took a job, and I moved out here in the winter of 19. 70, so it was like February of 1970. I drove across from uh, East Tennessee, and uh, in the uh, it was snowing like crazy. My first dry day in here, I got to Springfield, and I stayed at the uh, uh, lamplighter that was up on Sunshine. And my car was the snow was so bad that I couldn't even turn in the parking lot because I'd been driving straight on the highway because it was frozen up. The ice was in there. And then, but I remember there was a, a car wash right at the corner of Seminole and Glenstone. Anybody remember that? I think there's a funeral home there now. So I kind of got over there and got into this thing, got that thing and got my wheels so I could turn and park and got my motel room and went over to Stroud Realty for my first day of work. And then that was a Monday. That night, I got out, you know, and I started checking things out. You know, I had to go out and see like what's, the, I'd been in bands and stuff in college. And I wanted to see what was cooking in Springfield, Missouri. So I got out and I went to the Colonial Hotel, the Rendezvous, you know, because that's what the guy at the hotel said, go to the Rendezvous, they got a good little combo there. So I went down to the Rendezvous and they had a guy named playing on the, on the masthead, it was a guy named Don Clements. And then I went in there, but Don Clements wasn't up there. There's was a piano there in a place that looked like it was reserved for the big star, but he wasn't there yet. But there was a combo playing. And I know now who they were. There was a guy on drums named Benny Mahan. There was a guy on keyboards named Mike Cassidy. There was a guy on guitar named Rex Meredith. There was a guy on bass named Dave Pease. You know, they're all friends of mine now. Well, the ones that are left. And uh, I sat there and I watched that combo. Now, I con was a little bit, being a little bit immersed in music, I'm going, Good God Almighty, this is this is good. These guys are good. This is like way better than you see in most bars in most places. And then Don Clements came out and sang his. He was like he did the. He'd come out and he'd sing three or four songs. And then he'd go back, you know. And these guys would play the, the hits of the day, you know. And and the people just dancing. The young guys, the young folks in there. And I and I right there in my mind, I go. The Don Clements guys, days may be numbered here, but I think this band will probably have a job. Well, I was right. They stayed on, Don went, they moved on from bar, different bar to different bar, and then, you know, made a lot of history in Springfield, Missouri. Well, 
in Springfield, in Springfield, Missouri, uh, there's a big story of why I think Springfield is. I'll get to that in a second. But there was a recording studio here. Well, it didn't take me very long to learn that. So I, I went to this recording studio. It was run by a guy named Wayne Carson. Now, I had met Wayne Carson one time before. Is that better? Can you hear me in the back? Did you start over? <laughs> I'm, I'm not from Springfield. You probably, that's hard to believe, right? Okay. So Wayne Carson, okay, he's a songwriter. He wrote a song called The Letter. Give me a ticket for an arrow. You've heard that, right? Soul Deep, Neon Rainbow. These were all songs that were in my, in my, uh, you can turn that down just a little bit right there. Down, down, down. Check down, 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 down. I'll make it work. Okay. So I, I learned that Wayne Carson lived here. So he had the studio. So I went over there and reintroduced myself. He didn't remember. I'd met him in Memphis one time. And reintroduced myself to Wayne. And then he was in there every night cutting demos, bringing in guys like Lloyd Hicks, bringing in guys like Bobby Threadgill and uh, Bill Jones. And they were cutting demos. Wayne would write a song, he'd get his crew together, they'd, they'd cut a demo, and it was just most it was exciting to watch those drums being played, hear that song come back, and it was really exciting to me. I just, and I, again, I said, there's just way more going on here than any place I've ever been, you know, and I'd, I'd been a few places. But as I went on, I found out there's a, the reason that Springfield is Springfield. The reason Springfield has way more to offer, way more to present, and is way more musical and has a whole lot more musical depth than, you know, than, than com comparable towns. Duluth. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and the reason, what, reason is this. KWTO, keep watching the Ozarks. That sign just blasted when I drove in this room. Keep yeah. watching the Ozarks. KWTO. Did anybody remember that? Yeah. Okay, that's the first thing I saw when I got to Springfield. Turn on KWTO, and back in the 30s, the 20s, uh, Ralph Foster started that station. 20s and the 30s, if you got up in, I'm 70 years old, so I remember like early, early morning radio in the country, and you'd hear a radio station, the Martha White, 15 minutes, you'd hear uh, Lonzo and Oscar or somebody of that ilk, uh, Mother Maybell, or, well, not Mother Maybell, but uh, Wilma Lee and Sony Cooper would have a radio show that would be broadcast. But they had local entities here in Springfield that had radio shows, 15 minute radio shows, maybe a half hour radio show every morning, starting at 4.30 in the morning while they're milking the cows, getting the, starting the tractor, they'd have the radio show on, the people would be listening to these people. And they'd be singing, they'd be playing, they'd be doing the songs of the day, there'd be songs that they wrote, Whatever, they did it. Those people played every day. So they became regional celebrities. They could go to El Dorado Springs. They could go to up in, uh, anywhere in, in uh, uh, Cedar County. They could go to Fair Grove, go to the high school, put on a show like on a Wednesday night, and people would show up and listen to the act that came from KWT or they heard on the radio that morning. Those, that went on for years. Mr. Foster had the vision to see that this is like, this has a, a little more going on than, than, exactly was, than, than exactly happening. KWTO had 10,000 watts clear channel. If that means anybody, anybody's not on radio, anybody that's in radio would know that that means at night there were 10,000 watts. Daytime stations went off, nighttime stations stayed on. They had a, an antenna that blew pretty much north. So people all the way up into Canada, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, were getting the KWTO radio station. So late at night, early in the morning, they'd pick it up. They'd hear these people. Somebody had the, the Ralph Foster and some other folks had the vision to start something called the Ozark Jubilee. It was down here at the Landers Theater, down here at the corner of near McDaniel and Jefferson in that little park area where, what, what, what's that? Jewel. Oh, the Jewel Theater. What did I say, Landers? Uh, I'm sorry, I meant the Jewel Theater. And uh, you know, I'm not from, <laughs> I'm doing my best. Okay. Um, they started this Jewel Theater and they put these same acts on 
and then bring in some, some luminaries from time to time. And they started drawing people from Iowa, from Illinois, from Wisconsin, from Minnesota, from North Dakota, South Dakota. They would come down and then they hold these signs up, South Dakota, Minnesota. And they give and it was on the radio and it became immensely popular. Ralph Foster and Cy Simon got to get Cy Simon was a started out as a kind of a promoter here in Springfield, he told me, that he would book bands like Tommy Dorsey, uh, big band stuff into the Shrine Mosque, and that was, he was kind of a promoter type guy. He hooked up with Ralph Foster, and they, together, between them, thought, you know, this is a saleable product. They went to New York City, went to the big dogs at ABC, and sold them on the idea of putting the Ozark Jubilee on television, network television. That began, I think, in 1956. The first shows, I think, went from Columbia, but the show went on, on network television. Now, 1956, I'm telling you, network television was something, you know what I mean, because I watched, you know, television on a little Zenith TV about that big. And we watched the Ozark Jubilee every night, every Saturday night. My dad would make us watch it, and he would talk about, you know, now look at that guy, that's, that's Red Foley, he's like so-and-so. And so I would watch it, I saw it, it was a part of my life, it was a part of a lot of people's life. Uh, that re you, have to admit, you, have to, you have to kind of understand that the pro a production like a weekly network television show from Springfield, Missouri, it would be like Letterman coming on, you know, at night, or, you know, that, it's that big of a deal. They brought in the TV guys, grips, everything. It was like a big crowd of people came here every week to do that and stayed in Springfield the full time while they were doing that. So that show became incredibly popular. And it was on and through 1962, I think, and then it changed, I think, to NBC sometime around 1960, I'm not sure. But the show was on for six years or so. And it was a network show on TV every Saturday night. It was a big, 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 big deal. All right. By virtue of that, Cy and Ralph Foster rubbed elbows with, breathed the same air as, talked with a lot of folks that had a lot of clout in the entertainment and the music business. Cy and Ralph got into the publishing business, the music publishing business. And so at that point, they started working with local writers, Johnny Mullins, Wayne Carson, Ronnie Self, There's a lot of writers right here in Springfield. They learn that you could write a song and a publisher could take that song if it was good, take it to Nashville, New York or LA and get it recorded and you could make some money, you know? And this thing started happening here in Springfield on that level and all started happening because these guys started the Ozark Jubilee and made the network, the, the networking and the uh, personal connections that they made so that to bring the business to Springfield, Missouri. And that's why when I walked in here, I said, there's more going on here than there's going on in Duluth. I didn't know, really didn't know Duluth that well, but it, it, it's a similar size city. But that, in my opinion, people got to know. Musicians got to know. The guys got to know. They were playing. Nick Sibley lived up in El Dorado Springs, right? Right. Right? You heard about it, didn't you? You knew. Nick, Nick was like, kind of like me. We're kind of like compadres in this, in this area. He wrote the songs. I wrote the songs. You know, we learned that you needed a demo, you know. You got a, what is a demo? A demonstration recording that is designed to like present to an artist or a record label for potential use of the song to make money and earning royalties. People didn't have that kind of depth. I think still today in the small towns around Springfield, Missouri, that you have uh, just because somebody's uncle, somebody's grandfather, somebody's, somebody's relative learn or maybe went to Cy Simon and pitched a song to add a talk with him. Cy Simon explained the business to him. That guy went home and explained the business to his son or to his nephew and people learn more. So I just really think that's why Springfield, Missouri has a uh, way more going on for it musically than most, than most from a real music industry standpoint. Uh, my partner in a couple of business ventures here, you know, he, they're getting fewer all the time, you know, but uh, uh, Tom Whitlock's down right over there, wrote, take my breath away, right? Now he's like a recent, a recent uh, 
a little more, get up into the 80s or 90s. And uh, then, you know, I, I really feel sorry for the guy that wrote Live, uh, Live Like You're Dying. The, the, he's a spring, he has a Springfield connection that was a big hit just a couple of years. And Jim Nichols? Tim Nichols. Tim Nichols. You know, I, I'm sorry I forgot that name. But it's just, it's one of those things that's a continuum. Okay, back to when I came to Springfield. I ran into guys like Bobby Lloyd Hicks. He was just, just Lloyd Hicks at that time. Uh, he got bigger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Benny Mahan, Bobby Threadgill, uh, uh, Dave Pease. Uh, Willie Richardson's one of the first guys I met. We were like, you know, we were bumping in there. I met Chris Albert and his uh, beautiful sister way back in those days. You know, we're just like bumming around, going from place to place seeing who was playing. You could go out to Springfield Lake and you'd see a band doing songs they wrote. Why? Because there was something in the water in Springfield, Missouri that said if you did original material or if you did songs you wrote, you probably had, there was a chance you could make something go. There were, I, I, one of the first places I went was a little place down on Jefferson called Ananda Leather Company. And uh, in there that night I was playing, I was standing around, I said, I didn't know anybody. I just kind of stand around like this on that wall like this, you know, like that and some, you know, like, and, and uh, we'd, we'd stand there and look and I didn't know anybody. And there, would be, there was a band playing called Granny's Bathwater. It was a quartet, had Bobby Lloyd Hicks on it, you know, playing drums, uh, Larry Lee. And, uh, uh, and they played blues songs, you know, but that was the beginning and they had a name, Granny's Bathwater. And I thought, hey, that's, Pretty cool, you know, <laughs> and uh, and and it, you know, it morphed into one of the biggest entities that ever came out of this town. And I was telling Bill Jones that uh, who who was in Granny the uh, as it morphed into. If, if you guys, uh, Brian, I think you 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 linked up something the other day on Granny's Bathwater when they were playing on the Midnight Special backing up Martha Reeves. You got to go see that. You have to go look at that, and you have to watch that nine-piece aggregation. Bobby Lloyd Hicks on drums, Benny Mahan singing, Mike Bungie, Bill Jones. I can't even remember all of them. I can if you give me long enough, but I won't stand here and scratch my head. Playing on that stage, Martha Reeves, it was the template of what a real professional band should look like, sound like, and do when they're backing up somebody backing up somebody of note. It was like, it, it, it's right there. I told Bill the other day, I said, that, that was like, that was consummate everything right there. That was like, that set the mold. That's what Springfield bands, Springfield bands are just better bands. You know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know why, you know, but you just, it just, it, it's something in the water around here and along with that little long line of know-how and ingenuity, creativity, help from guys like Wayne Carson, Cy Simon, and Ralph Foster that just kind of pushed people to do more and become songwriters. Like my friend King Clarence Brewer here, you know. I've played with the, I've played with the King, right? right? I am uh, Brentwood Slim. <laughs> uh, so but my point today was I just wanted to let you know that what it was like to come to Springfield, Missouri and like immediately, just like that, no, there's more, there's more going on than, than you'd sit and find in another place. Uh, I think Lloyd pretty much the other day went through like the history of like a lot of these bands and how they morphed from one band into another band. But I just want to tell you, I wanted to share with you what it was like to be a dude that didn't know anybody that walked in here, stood next to John Dillon, you know, John Dillon, like, who's this guy? You know what I mean? Like, like two dogs standing next to a pole. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> trying to figure out, uh, you know, like, well, what's up with this guy right here? Like, yeah, you know. And, uh, and I was sitting there going, like, it. and uh, so it was, it, w it was just, it was, it was illuminating to me and it stayed illuminating, and uh, my, jo my job didn't, I didn't do too well with my job at Stroud Realty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to say I tried. 
you know, I, I didn't steal anything. I, I, I just, a year later, I didn't have a job, you know what I mean? And I drifted back into playing, you know? And so, and, and I just kind of stayed in Springfield. I like Springfield, I love Springfield. This is my home. And uh, that's, you know, my, my point today was to try to see if I could like lay a little bit of like uh, of the real history. This is like, there, okay. The Oxford American wrote a real good article. A friend of mine named uh, Dave Hoekstra from Chicago wrote a great article. Two, it was a two month, over two months issues of the Oxford American about music in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, it's like, if you can go Google that up, it's a really, really good historical. Uh, the book uh, about the Ozark Jubilee, I can't remember the name of the lady. It's got some wonderful pictures in it. I've got the, uh, it's like, great stuff, great stuff. You know, it's like, you live in a good town, you live in a, in a great town, it's gonna be a size of Cleveland here in about 10 more years. And, uh, but I think it will still have the stuff in the water that makes Springfield, Missouri, what it is. And I'd like, any questions? <laughs> See you later. Sure. The Symptoms got formed. Okay, The Symptoms was a band. Uh, Donnie Thompson, D. Clinton Thompson, one of the greatest guitar players on the face of the earth, from right here in Springfield, Missouri, uh, and I, my former wife, and were playing up in Rolla. Uh, okay, I had like taken off in my, after I, after I, kind of left the, the corporate world, I got back into like traveling around playing holiday inns and Ramada inns all over the United States, playing with bands that dressed alike and did steps and, you know, and practice four times a week. So where you got a room, you made $250 a week, you had your own room and a free meal. And I'll tell you what, you don't get any richer than that in 19, 1971. And that's like, that is like, you know, so, so, uh, I, Traveling around doing it, and we needed a guitar player. Donnie Thompson, I had met at uh, the rock shop. He had worked there, and uh, he was kind of in between gigs. So we we got together and we started playing some lounge gigs and stuff. And so we were doing a house gig up in Rolla. It was pretty easy. We just sat down and played this one place permanently. Played six nights a week. We learned that if you could play, if you would learn top forty stuff, like a disc, if you if you'd learn some disco songs to please those people who wanted to do the hustle, they'd let you do any damn thing you wanted to do <laughs> after that. So we'd play Who Song after that. And they'd just sit there politely, oh, you did your Who Song, then when you played the hustle, boy, they'd be up there doing it, you know. But they put up with you if you stayed halfway current. You know, Donnie, I guess, is the guy that had more uh, insight to me than, than I did. It's about, you know, if you, if you pick your, you can, you can kind of weasel your way out of lounges by just weaseling your way out of lounges. So I, like, you start playing more Who and songs you wrote and less uh, uh, Casey and the Sunshine Gang, and pretty soon you'll just kind of, you know, things will work your way. You, you won't have a job anymore. So, but Donnie had the idea of like doing, having a band that, number one, we couldn't do anything. That we, we picked our members, Jim Wonderly, my ex-wife was on keyboards, Mary Lee. Uh, Ron Grimp was a rummer from, from Rolla. Donnie and myself. The rule one was you couldn't, you couldn't do any song that anybody knew that we'd already done in a band like last year. No, none of that, none of that. So we had to learn. We could, do it, we could do old songs, we could do anything we wanted to, but it just couldn't be something everybody knew. You couldn't do them changes. Okay, so. We, we learned those songs and we, we learned a, and we, we kind of set a path toward, we, we started rehearsing and rehearsed five nights a week for four months before we ever played a gig. So, and we learned a, 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 a song list that we thought might be, we were collect record collectors too. So we were by, back in the early, in the early, late, mid 70s, Elvis Costello, The Sex Pistols, Oddball, 
independent records. We were just like glom onto those all the time. Uh, and, and so we, th we were thinking, well, you get, if you just be a little bit different, you know, maybe somebody will go. So we, 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 we tried our thing, and, and it kind of worked. It worked here in Springfield, and it worked in the region. And we did that for a couple of years and became, you know, very popular, you know, made a lot of money. And uh, then that kind of ran its course because several bands, we were playing mostly covers, mostly going back and seeking out oddball covers by semi-unknown bands from the 60s, you know, uh, psychedelic era and, so, era and so forth. Maybe some old rock and roll and rockabilly and these things. Well, that, several bands cropped up and started doing that, so we just became, kind of became passe. And then we just kind of took the same idea toward playing to, toward other bands and we started another band called the Skeletons and uh, with uh, uh, Nick played in it, Donnie and I played in it, uh, Bobby Lloyd uh, and we just kind of moved on through the time just trying to be a little bit oh, if, in our in our thinking maybe a little bit left of center <laughs> you know and uh, uh, and try to be you know entertaining you know and uh, Pick stuff that people liked and move fast. You know, <laughs> that answer your question. Any other question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So when you came to Springfield, you were already. I was already 26. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you said you went to college. You, you weren't in music. No, I was. Okay. I was in the business department, but I played in bands. I'm not a real musician. I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm an actor, and I spent most of my life playing the part of a bass player, and later a recording person, and now a speaker. <laughs> but, but I'm just a guy who plays bass. I'm not a musician. There's a big, big, big difference between I'm a guy who plays bass, and so I just I just kind of brought that, and you know, and I just. The Springfield was pretty hotbed. If you wanted to play, there was there were bands starting up and people you could play with and and a good people to good people to get around and play that could could accomplish what you wanted. You, know? you can make a living. Did, oh, yeah, I've never done anything else. I mean, no, I mean you can make a living then compared to. You that. could. You can't today. still today. You can make a living in Springfield, New York. You got to work three jobs yeah. to be in a rock band. You know, but in Springfield, you can make you can actually make enough to you know in a living. Well. There's several definitions of living, but you know, get by. You know, but it's it's fun. I'll tell you, I you know, I love Springfield. It's home. And Who all have you recorded down at your studio? I mean, big. You? Not just me. I recorded Katie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a real <laughs> Mostly local folks. Um, I recorded. I have recorded Brewer and Shipley. I've recorded Ozark Mountain Daredevils. I've recorded. I've recorded most of the local folks. Uh, I, back in those days of the Symptoms and the Skeletons, we kind of earned a reputation as a kind of a roots rocky, alt, alt, alt country Americana type crowd. And so, and being fortunate to be in those bands, we got to play all over the country. You know, we we got popular enough to go play on both coasts and around, and so we made a lot of friends. And in that connection, well, there was another guy named Jim Martin. He died a couple of years ago. Jim got into the publishing business and started a recording studio. And I went to work for him uh, engineering uh, back in the early 80s and uh, did some boxcar willy sessions and so forth and eventually wound up buying that studio from him, from him and his ex-wife. But, uh, okay, who, who's recorded? Okay, everybody local you can think of and a few people you've never heard of that came to Springfield to work with us. That would be the crowd of people that I've recorded with that, that I, you know, the people I would call on in this town would be Donnie Thompson, Bobby Lloyd Hicks, Nick Sibley, Joe Terry. There's just people that, that are kind of simpatico, with, that, that are real quick studies, can learn and can play just about anything. And, you know, and they, people have seen that band play and they came, they came and wanted to have that band play with them. 
and and so they would come to town and do it. So that's a people from out of town. Not a lot. Nobody much you ever heard of. Scott Kempner? Huh? Scott Kempner? Oh, yes, yeah, Scott Kempner. Yeah, top ten. We did him. Eric Amble, uh, Mary McBride, Jonathan Richmond, uh, Robbie Folks. Robbie Folks. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, you know, these are these are all big luminaries. Everybody going. I have heard a name I recognize yet. You know. <laughs> Will, Wilco, yeah, okay, Wilco. Jim Dandy? Who's that? Jim Dandy. Jim Dandy, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah, Jim. You know, Jim Dandy's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. uh, Jim Dandy's like, he's cool. I always saw him on South Street. Yeah, yeah, anyway. But Springfield, so, all right, I'm going to take it one step further. Recording studio. I wouldn't be in the recording business if Ralph Foster, Cy Simon, and Wayne Carson had been in this town. It wouldn't have happened, you know, just like, I saw what happened, and I wanted to be a part of that. I think Nick, would you? Would you? Oh, yeah. yeah. So Nick's got a recording studio. I've got a recording studio. Great studios. There's another one out here on 2100 Studio 21. All professional recording studios can do just about whatever you want. This is Springfield, Missouri, a town of like 150,000 people. You don't. You just don't. There's not that kind of. You don't see that. You know. There's more going on here just because of what went on in the past. You know. And it's like. But, yes. Charlie Hayden, you know. Oh, Charlie Hayden, the the jazz bass player. You yeah. know it. Oh man, yeah, that's like. That there's, I found that there's so many big stars that live here that you'll never ever see them or hear about them. Steel players, drummers, uh, Neil Lawson, and all those guys are here. They're all doing that. And and I tell you what, Chris, they 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 benefited from what we we're just talking about. Yeah. All of this, all of this music that went on, all of this knowledge, all of this professionalism, you know, it's like you just don't, you don't have that amalgamate in a certain, in a, in a region. It just doesn't happen that often. Now, Branson, back in the 90s, Branson. Yeah, well, Branson, I, I, you know, I like Branson, but I'm t they wouldn't have been a Branson if it hadn't been a Springfield. Oh, yeah. It's darn right. You know, it's like, you know, Branson kind of took the, uh, they took the Ozark Jubilee model and did what, Oh, I, you know, Johnson and Johnson to do with it, you know. <laughs> but so, any other? I'd love to answer another question. Yes, ma'am. So, did you ever work with uh, Cy Simon? Yeah, I pitched songs to Cy. Yes, indeed. I'd write a song. Hell yes. I'd sit there and write a song, you know. And I'd write a song that night, and I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just couldn't wait. I'd get on the phone. I'd call Cy Simon. I got a song. I'd go in there and play it for him. He'd go, yeah. you know, Lou, I kind of like your voice. And he says, you know, so, and he gave me advice. And I'll tell you what, this town, it's advice. <laughs> I'm another old guy. You know what I'm talking about? Young kids will come in there and I'll just get, and they'll get, it's just an old guy talking. That guy never told me anything that wasn't exactly right on the money. You know what I mean? It's like, he, he say, well, that's kind of clever, but you know, that kind of the subject matter of that is kind of limiting. You know, it's, 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 you need, he told me, you got to write songs that the cop on the beat, the, doc, the, the doctor, the lawyer, the Indian chief, anybody can latch onto. Not, you know, don't write these songs about being in bands. Don't write these songs. <laughs> don't write these songs about how tough it is to have bad monitors and stuff like that. You know, just like write write a song that, that anybody can latch on to. You know. So the the thing that, that I would go, you know, is like Nick and I've had this talk. You remember that fat black pencil you got in the first grade that didn't have an eraser on it? You remember that? Remember that paper that had two dark blue lines and the dotted blue? You remember those? Oh, yeah. Everybody remembers those. So get that in your song. Okay. <laughs> then then people. People will, people will relate, you know, they can write, you give them something you can talk about. Everybody's had some heartbreak and everybody, you know, so, you, but Cy, he would tell me, you know, and then I became a better songwriter because Cy picked up a couple of my songs and said, I'll see what I can do with that, you know what I mean? And that meant I felt real good, you know, I felt like I must be making some progress, you know, and, and I still, Cy, stuff Cy Simon told me, songwriters still, they'll come, people come in, a lot of bands come in, they write their own songs. Well, if you're a singer-songwriter, you don't really need a publisher, you need a record label to sell your product, you know. But if you're a songwriter, you need a publisher, much like a literary agent, that can take your idea or your song and induce somebody to 
record that song so money can be made from royalties on it. So you have to write songs that are more fitting to everybody. Wayne Carson, perfect example, man. He wrote those songs that anybody could do. Uh, Ronnie Self, he wrote those songs that anybody could do. Johnny Mullins, he was a songwriter. He didn't do his own song. People did these songs. So, uh, you know, song, it's, it's, it's the, I think, does that answer your question at all a little bit? It's Somebody else? The old KWT, it's still out there, the big old rock. Drive by there, 9, 12, what is it? 1121 South Glenstone. Go by and look at that big old gray stone building. That's one of the first places I went to. They recorded companies coming upstairs in that, that little studio they had up there. Lloyd Hicks played drums on it. <laughs> you, know, you know, and it was like, uh, no, that, that was like, uh, I, was over, I went over there, it's one of the first stops I made. Speaking of being an actor, how did you get your commercial breakthrough? Oh, okay. I did a commercial. Uh, well, uh, you want to know? I was in a band, see? And uh, we, played at the, we played at this place called the, uh, the Hangar. The Hangar it was down here. Okay, back in the early 80s. There were a couple of guys that were frat guys who were like, they, they were always drunk. And they were good guys, and I got to know them. I made friends with them. They went on to get into the advertising business. And they did a thing called the Budweiser of Frogs, you know, Bud, why, sir? You know, they came up with that idea, you know, they did well, okay? Yeah. I'm sitting at the studio one day back, a few years back, phone rings and I get, there's a lady on the phone said, I'm so-and-so with such and such advertising and said, I'm wondering, would you be interested in going to California and doing a part in a, in a uh, commercial that we're putting together. Uh, you know, I'm going, I think I told her, I said, well, I'm 59 years old, and I pretty much don't have much to do for the rest of my life. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what it is, you know, but you got in mind. I said, yeah. She said, well, could you, could you do it on short notice? I said, yeah. <laughs> so she explained to me, these guys went on to the average, so they were in California, cutting a commercial for <laughs> a thing called uh, Jack Daniels Hard Cola. Okay. Uh, so they had been out there doing this commercial shoot and th they had been auditioning people to play the part of an old grizzled <laughs> cook <laughs> with a six-month chip. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, back air cooking to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> so to, to the, 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 the band, the bass player didn't show up for the gig, and they're all out there, and then the, the bass player, you know, this guy's cooking, but he's a bass player, so he comes out and he saves the day. That was the idea. So they're looking for that bass player. Well, they told me that they had auditioned 300 guys, and they had, they had plenty of guys who looked the part, who were perfectly looking guy, perfect looking, it was Hollywood, of course they did. And so, but they couldn't get the guy that looked like he knew what he was playing on the bass. You know what I mean? So, they said they really wanted to do that, so they asked me if, uh, if, if I could give them any kind of a reference. And so, it, this, 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 is how, this is how stuff happened. Dudley Brown, keyboard player, played in bands with, was in, he's, into, he's into everything technical. He was into video. And so he had, I'd just been out of his house the night before, and he says, I got this green screen thing, look at this, I can put you up in front of this right here, and you, you do that thing like the weatherman does, where you just stand in front of the you know, thing, and you just see your, your, see your, your outline on this big green screen. And, uh, he said, I said, it's pretty neat again. So I, the gal says, is there any way you could get us anything that we could take a look at? I said, well, how about if I get you a, a green screen demo of me and my bass playing? And like, she says, you can do that? <laughs> I said, can't everybody? <laughs> you know, so, so, so I went over to Dudley's. I told him what was up. I did that. He, he emailed it to, you know, just we just transferred it up there to him. They come, they said, she called me, they're looking at it right now, and they're gonna make a decision. How late, you know, I said, call me if you want me. <laughs> so, 
I laid in bed. I went to bed that night about 10.30. I thought, well, it's not going to happen. 15 till midnight, here came a call. They wanted me to get on the plane at 6 o'clock in the morning and go out to L.A. and shoot this commercial. So I went out there, three days in Hollywood. That's when I learned that the TV movie industry spills more money than the music industry makes. <laughs> it's like they had three semi trucks and a hundred people out there doing this this jingle, you know. So, but I was the I was the focal point of it. So I went out there and did it, and it, you know, I, I made a chunk of money off of that. That was like a pretty good year. Uh, but uh, that's how that's how that happened, and uh, it was like people were talking to me. You gonna get an agent? I'm going. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Bald guy, 59, 60 year old bald guy, you know, get a good agent, you bet. No, but it was just a one shot deal. I knew it and I enjoyed the hell out of it and I made, you know, a good chunk of money at it. So that's how that happened. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, what was it like working with Jonathan Richmond? Jonathan Richmond. How many people know Jonathan Richmond? Okay. Jonathan Richmond, okay, again, by virtue of being in Springfield, Bobby Lloyd, Donnie Thompson, and myself. We're out playing with a guy named Steve Forbes who came in town and hired us back in, you know, 1979. Well, we were already Jonathan Richmond's fans and had Jonathan Richmond records and stuff. So we were playing in San Francisco. Donnie and I were rooming together. I think Lloyd had the single that night. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we're, and so Jonathan Richmond was a friend of Steve Forbes. They had met up in New York, you know, because they were kind of moving in the same circles, singer-songwriter circles. So Jonathan came to the show. Well, Donnie and I immediately, we all recognized Jonathan, and we go, Jonathan Richmond. He goes, well, it's me. And so we, we, we got to yapping about old records and this and that. And so we, we went, went back to the hotel. And Jonathan comes back. And so Donnie and I, we were rooming together. And so Jonathan gets in, he comes in the room. We sit there and we talk till probably 4 o'clock in the morning about old records, uh, this group and that group, girl groups, everything old, just old music oriented, you know, until finally we were in the middle of a conversation about the Bobby Fuller Four. <laughs> and so <laughs> I've, I remember I was, I was laying on my bed like this. And finally, I think in the middle of the conversation, so I'm asleep. Next morning, I don't know what time it was, I kind of wake up like this and I go, Look at him, and Jonathan's sleeping in the, between the two beds. And he wakes up and he goes, well, you know that, that Bobby Fuller <laughs> Ford, he, like, he picks up the conversation right where we left off. You know, like, <laughs> and I'm going, I said, that's how I met Jonathan Richmond right there. And since that, we played on records with Jonathan. Uh, I, you know, he comes back to Springfield every year because he likes, he likes Springfield, he loves the crowd, and he plays down at the Outland at Matt's other place, and he, he enjoys it, and he comes back all the time, and he's, he's got a Springfield connection, you know. And uh, Stormy Cox right there, the third guy I met when I came to Springfield. The Platters played at the Grove. Remember the Grove? Oh, yeah. The Grove is where I learned about cashew chicken. That's a whole other story. All right. Uh, we're sitting there like the Platters are there. Stormy, he'd back, what, maybe three months from Nam, and... We're sitting together, you know, we're both liking this R&B because I, I had a kind of an R&B background when I was playing in college. And, you know, so we became, we became friends at that moment, you know, we've been, we're friends, you know, every, every bar I go in, <laughs> Stormy and I wind up being in there together at some point, you know. Two words, James Brown. James Brown, uh, one of my heroes, probably saw James Brown play eight or ten times in my lifetime. And uh, uh, live back when I was, back when I was younger. Uh, living down south. Uh, remember Channel Z radio station? Okay. Remember when it really took a big jump and a, and a guy came in from uh, Atlanta, Georgia named uh, 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 Frank Copsidus, yeah. bought the station and then just pumped a bunch of money into it and turned it into like the biggest, you know, now, 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 alternative music was a big name back in those days. Frank Copsidus came to town, took over that station and I started doing some things for him. I did some rec a lot of rec okay. I've recorded No Doubt, The Verve Pipe, Counting Blue Car, uh, dozens of those acts that we did a thing called uh, uh, Channel Z Live uh, that, that would be on a radio. They would come into the studio, we record them live, and then it would get on there. The thing, I've still got all those tapes. And uh, so Frank and I worked on that. Frank also did 
uh, he also managed a band called the Judy Bats for a while, and they needed a mix, and I, I, record, I, I did a mix or two for them, recorded some other people for them, and the guy that was a, uh, uh, one of the guys, they did the Dare to Care concerts and stuff, and I did work with Frank for a long time. He wound up managing James Brown after he sold Channel Z here, and he moved to New York. He wound up managing James Brown, and he called me because they had an archival project, Let's try to get the stuff off of old school tape and into the digital realm. And, uh, and he wanted me to do it. He wanted me to help out with it. So I took Dan Selim, my technical guy at the studio that helps me out. And, he, and we just loaded up the truck, took every one of our machines, went down and moved into James Brown's guest house for a month of February. And uh, we started taking tapes out of his chicken house and storage places and everything that he had cleaning them up, drying them out, and transferring them into a digital format for him, you know, for the, for, for the whole month. And I got a chance to, I was always a, already a, a gigantic big James Brown fan, but getting to work on those tracks and listen to like multi-track recordings, 16 track recordings done in New York in A&R Studios back in 1970 with him, Jill, Marva Whitney, and other background singers where James Brown would be in the booth on one microphone with the girl singer singing this duet that I'd bought the record, you know, I had the record in my collection, singing on one mic, absolutely perfectly, blending perfectly in perfect tune to a band playing live all at once on an afternoon like that. I listened to that on the multi-track and I tell you what, I became like, I, I, all of a sudden I realized, you gotta be James Brown to be James Brown. You, know I mean? <laughs> you gotta be Elvis to be Elvis. You, know, you gotta be Little Richard to be Little Richard. You gotta be Jerry Lee Lewis if you're gonna be Jerry Lewis. There's a reason these people become what they are. And it's like everything to do with natural ability and originality. So that's James Brown's story. Well, Lou, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a Baptist preacher. Thank <laughs> you.